Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the gifts you've given us. We thank you for our freedom, this wonderful country, the beautiful day that we are enjoying, and the fellowship of those around us. We ask that you open our, our whole bodies uh, as we go forth in this study to learn the message that it's giving us and see how we can apply that to our lives, if we can apply it to our lives. Bless all of those in harm's way today, especially our first responders who will be overworked by the end of this weekend, and protect all of them, our family here at the church as they travel, and protect us as we study your word, and as we return to our, wherever we go. We ask all this in your son's name, amen. 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 So what should we do here? I guess reading those who have books available to them to read the first chapter. And we want to start. And I suggest I'll, I'll start. I uh, suggest <coughs> Yes. Stop when you want to stop and we'll go to the second person who is. Who's going to read second? Yeah, that's fine. I'll read a second. A second, and then after that, we'll figure it out. Well, we'll stop and talk, probably. Okay. There's someone in my room, I said, as I wandered into the living room, wearing my Star Wars pajamas and clinging onto my Spider-Man action figure. Her response was firm. My mom didn't play games. John, there's no one in your room. Now go to bed. She did not believe me, and why would she? Wasn't this a common five-year-old ploy to get out of going to sleep? Hadn't I used other excuses before, like, I need to drink a water, or I need to go to the bathroom, or I lost my Darth Vader toy? Go on, she said again, and I climbed the stairs and crawled under the covers. Peeking out, looking into the darkness of my room, I saw it again, just past my feet. In the shadowed corner of the room, the same figure stood, still staring at my bed. I couldn't see his face, only the outline of a dim shape. What's more, I could feel the presence of the unknown person. Not knowing if I should fear my father more than the possibility of a stranger in my room, I bolted from my room and ran downstairs for a second time, willing my parents to believe me. There's someone up there, and he's staring at me. Short on patience and insisting I was perfectly safe, my father said that if I knew what was good for me, I wouldn't come down a third time. That's when the truth set in. I had to be brave. I returned to my room, crawled under my covers again. Seconds passed, then a minute. My eyes adjusted to the dark, and as I looked past my feet, I saw the same figure for a third time. This time was different. I was not afraid. I was surprised. As I stared down the figure in that corner, words came into my mind. The words were not audible, but they were so real and clear to me, it was just as if my mom or dad had spoken to me face for face. I remember every word just as if it happened last night. You need to give your heart to Jesus. My first response was childlike and simple. One word, okay. Then in the silence of my bedroom, wondering if I'd said enough, I added, Jesus, I give my heart to you. You are my boss. Seems like that's a good stopping point. Yeah. Looking back, it was a natural. Oh, that's okay. Oh, okay. I'd like to okay. throw in some discussion here. Okay. And say, just have any of us had an experience like this? Not exactly, but well, I'm guessing that being five years old and trying not to get have to go to bed is probably natural for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, probably, I would guess for most, if not all, thinking at one point in time there was some sort of monster or this or that hiding in my bedroom under my bed, you know, in, in the bathtub or wherever we were trying to get away from. 
Um, but, and I know I've had experiences like this as an adult, uh, making excuses for things I don't want to do at that time because I didn't want to do them. Um, and, you know, being afraid at times of some unknown thing. Uh, but did, and I'm speaking in general, it's just, uh, that's me. But at what point in your life, if ever, have you ever, at the time of this, I'll call it fear, um, and very intensely to what this young boy did and said he gave his heart to Jesus. And we'll go on with the rest of the story, but did we have any personal experiences of that happening at some specific point? Well, this isn't the come give your heart to Jesus story, but I was once driving down and I just took an exit ramp off I-95 and um, my car spun out, and so I'm doing this, and I heard very distinctly, you'll be okay. And I hit a highway sign right behind the back seat, uh, right behind my seat. I was in a Volkswagen at the time. And other than some bruises, I was just fine. Car was total, but scared Rick badly because he was traveling in front of me in his own Volkswagen. Um, had there's to give no a way to work. <laughs> yeah. There's no way I could have figured out that I would hit the sign that way and survive, especially in a Volkswagen. <laughs> and I'm really disappointed that God didn't speak to me more grammatically. I would have expected Old King English or Old King James English or something, but you'll be okay was the message. Well, that proves God speaks in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> I probably didn't have time for, thou shalt remain healthy throughout all of this. <laughs> that would be <been> cool. <laughs> the other thing that, that uh, you know, in the, in the Bible, whenever an angel shows up, the first reaction is fear. Right? I mean, you think about the shepherds in the field, yeah. right? The angel shows up, and the first that sore afraid is the word in the New King in Thank the you King James, you know. Thank you, Joseph. Hmm? Joseph. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 The right. And the first reaction is fear, and we see that here. The first reaction is, oh no, I got to run downstairs, and you know, searching for. <clears throat> but uh, the angel eventually. You know, uh, addresses the fear right off and says, "Be not afraid." And eventually, he gets to that here too. That uh, I remember a cartoon. It was an artist drawing cherubs. You could see his easel, and there are two angels, three times his size, with swords and wings and the whole bit. And they're going, "You should know, we're not cute." <laughs> The, the very last one you read was um, his first response was okay to his mother said and then when he came back wondering whether I had said enough and then he says says more than just okay well do we have to explain ourselves to God Wondering whether we set it up, or is you've got to give your heart to Jesus in a response of okay, enough. Well, I don't think we have to say it to Jesus, but we need to say it so we can can realize ourselves that is what we're saying. I am giving my heart to Jesus, not just okay we're, what you said. We're explaining but, it to yeah. ourselves. We're explaining it. Yeah, it's for our own benefit. It's for our own benefit. I commit to this. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I really mean this. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to repeat it or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, as, as Scripture says, you know, God knows before you even say. Right. So he knows. He knows what you're going to say. He knows who your response is going to be. But it's for your own benefit. For your own commitment. For your own understanding. Yeah, covenants were spoken. I didn't hear it. Oh, covenants were spoken. Oh, yeah. I mean, God said, here's what I'm giving you, and the people respond, amen. I mean, so. If yeah, they were spoken first by God. Yes, mm-hmm. well. Eliciting a response from us. Not spoken first by us, eliciting a response from God. Well, he felt that he had heard God. Oh, I... You must give your heart to Jesus. Mm. I've turned the page, so I don't know exactly. Well, words. let's continue and see how the story goes. Some will say, I imagined the entire thing, that there was no one there. Admittedly, this wasn't the first time that I thought I saw a person or a thing or a spaceship in my room. I don't presume to be so important that God had to perform a miracle just for me either. I don't know if my eyes are playing tricks on me, but truth be told, I do not know, nor do I care. My life changed that night, not because of a possible miraculous vision, but rather because of a belief in Jesus that I confessed with my mouth for the first time. No matter what I saw or didn't see, I am sure of this. That night, Jesus became my all, my everything, my rock of truth. At the time, I had no understanding of the implications of that decision. I didn't realize that in that very moment, alone in my room, the living God was reaching his hand into space and time and pulling me out of the darkness. I did not understand that God had softened my heart and given me the faith that allowed me to believe his words. I certainly had no idea that the John Cooper that had lived for only five years on this earth was witnessing the end of his old life and the beginning of a brand new redeemed life. My second birth, I had zero idea of how good, how wonderful, how powerful, and how gracious this God is. There was a lot I didn't understand, but that moment became the cornerstone of my life. I gave my heart to Jesus, and he became my boss. As the years that followed, I'd known him first as my savior and my boss. Eventually, I'd come to know him as a friend and a father who protects and lovingly and lo- lovingly disciples. Even eventually, I'd come to a place of total and passionate devotion to the God of the Bible, but it didn't start that way. During my early teenage years, I entered the hardest and loneliest years of my life. My mother, whom in many ways had been my spiritual leader, had lost her three-year battle with cancer. I was 14 years old, hurt, confused, and incredibly lonely. During that time, I prayed and prayed to God, my Savior, and my boss. But the loneliness would not go away. The hurt was not healed. Nothing helped. All that I heard was silence. But one night, something changed. I don't recall how the notion popped into my head. Perhaps I read it in my Bible. Maybe someone read it to me. Whatever the case, in the quiet of my room, I asked Jesus if I could know him in a different way, praying, Jesus, you are my boss, you are my savior. But would it be all right if I could know you as a friend? The moment I prayed it, I felt his response. I know no other way to say this. God placed his truth from the Bible in my heart and head. It was as if he was saying, Yes, I won't just come to you now as a friend, but also as a dad. In that moment, tears of joy and pain ran down my face. In fact, I never cried so hard as I did that night. Alone in the dark on my bed in Memphis, Tennessee, the God of the entire universe reached into my life and called my name, called me by by name. I don't know what else was happening at midnight on the streets of Memphis, Memphis, but one thing was certain. The kingdom of God was silently going about the business of shattering the kingdom of darkness and rescuing me, the brokenhearted. It was the night I learned that God is a faithful friend. These two moments have been foundational in my life, and everything else has been built upon them. 
God is my Father, and Jesus is my Lord. I have come to believe the words Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we, through whom all things and through whom we exist. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Jesus is also my Savior. I stand on the words of the Apostle Peter, who wrote, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, but now, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. 2 Peter 3.18 But Jesus is not just my Lord and Savior, he is also my friend. He intimated as much when he said, Greater love has no other than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. John 15, 13 to 15. The older I get, the more I realize the words of God are true. They are life. And the more I understand him, the more I come to know him, the more wonderful he's grown in my eyes. This is my story of becoming awake and alive in truth, not a version of truth, not partial truth, not cultural axioms of truth, not that I feel is true. I became alive to the eternal truth, truth that never changes, one that lies at the end of the pursuit of, for meaning. In a time when so many are falling into destruction, this truth has kept me safe, and it will keep me safe for the rest of my life and in the eternal life to come. That's a long, long and well read. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and <clears throat> here he talks about a very special type of relationship with God. One that grew from committing himself as a five-year-old, even though he didn't really know he did that, or maybe knew it but didn't understand what that type of commitment meant, through his life, through some troubles. <clears throat> and as we move on in his life, we also know that there was, you know, some non-troubles in his life. Some good things that are happening. But do you need to have the feelings that he's writing here to truly be a believer? Do you, do you need to have the elements that's here? The commitment to Christ, the asking for help asking for a friend and getting a friend and a, and a dad, as it says here, and as it's going on, that his, his beliefs became deeper and deeper. And <clears throat> it gets to the point in my mind where he is um, taking God in his life as a normal thing. As much as going to sleep, Waking up, celebrating a birthday, um, maybe standing in front of a congregation and delivering a message, and then say, good, I'm glad I did that. But a couple months later, I'll see you again. So now you gotta have the feeling that is this me all the time? <clears throat> and we all will tell Tom yes. <laughs> How, in our personal life, how are, how does this relate to where you are in your walk, where you want to be in your walk? You know, I'm not, I've not been able to get to be where I want to be. I've gotten close, gotten close many times and fallen back, um, but somehow that safety net was all, always there. No matter how many times I drifted in my life, um, something, I don't know, something, nothing. The Holy Spirit brought me back. Wouldn't let me go any further. Maybe stop right there and say, no, 
That's not the way you're supposed to go. You yanked me back. Painfully sometimes. You know, you yank, have we ever yanked you back really hard? Were it hurt? Were you accelerated and, and your G-forces went up to four or five? You know, that kind of pressure. That's, I personally have felt that more than once. So uh, just because you can't get there doesn't mean you don't stop trying. It doesn't mean that God won't be there to help you, push you, yank you, if need be. Hold you under water until you're almost drowning. Mm -hmm. And then let you get a little bit of air just to get you, get you focused. And I think that's what we're hearing here is a, a message of being focused on God at one point where the three trips down the stairs we heard of before, they weren't focused on God. They were focused on some, somewhere between fear of punishment from my parents to fear of an unknown thing in my room. So, and I can't even say that any time that I've drifted and got yanked back, that I uh, really felt any benefit or learned anything from that. Because I'm a true believer that Satan is in this world. Satan is as powerful as anything but God. He can do all things, and we have to remember that. Uh, you never have to ask, is this Satan Satan's doing? All you have to ask is, is God's doing? If it's not God's doing, guess what? You can join the other team, right? You can go back to where you came from. Hmm. Even if it means dropping from the majors to the minors, and dropping back to a point where you've got to restart, do stuff you've done two, three, ten times already. That's what needs to be done. You have to do it. Yeah. Uh, God does just not call you once. Right? Like he called this guy when he was five years old. And he called him again. Mm -hmm. And he called him again. Yep. And he continues to call each and every one of us over and over again. He doesn't do it just once. He said, okay, you're saved now. I'll go on to somebody else. He continues to call you. It's the omnipresent part. He's with all of us all the time. Right. I mean, you know, my experience <clears throat> coming to faith is not anything like what his was. Neither did mine. You know, and there's no boxes that I can check that he checked. But I can tell you, he continued to call me. He continued to call me. Even though I was rejecting him until I was, you know, over 40 years old. He continued to call. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? You weren't quite that old. Okay, 38. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, she was only 22. Yeah, she was only 22. <clears throat> and I was 64 at the time, so. <laughs> but, you know, and he just continued to call. And even even afterwards, you know, he continues to call. Even today, he continues to call. You know, I, I, I see today, you know, I, I look back and I go, you know, I grew up, you know, went to Sunday school, confirmation, all that stuff. And then as a teenager, you might want to drift away, drift away a little bit. And it started coming back. But when you come back, I came back and like, God was on Sunday, okay? And then when we had the yeah. first child, yeah. that's when we started coming yeah. back. Coming back to church, but, but God was still like Sunday only, and then he got into the Word, got more into the Word, and then now since I've retired, I'm more and more into the Word. Now it's even, he's even closer to me, and uh, yeah, I, I see that around the world today. You know, you, you see mm -hmm. it. I mean, you see it here, you see it everywhere. There's some people that are. We call them Easter bunnies that show up at Easter and Christmas, you know. And, but God still loves them, as you say, you know. And, uh, and then there's people that they come to church and walk out the door. And then there's people that come to church, read the Bible, you know, and really get to know them. And there's other people that, you know, do even a little bit more than that, you know. It's like you say, he's, he's there all the time. He's, you know, when they refer to him as father, as daddy, you know, dad, you know. I think that really, he really, he really does care about us, even though we screw up. 
you know, he really cares about it. He's always there, you know. And uh, I think it's appropriate that uh, some of the Greek words describe him as the caring father, you know, Baba. You know, really caring. Some, some of them describe him as uh, like a little daddy. You know, like he's, a, he's, he's daddy's little girl, you know. He just, just loves him so much that everybody clings to him. You know, so, you know, the, the, more, you, the more you're into the word, the, the, more you, the more you understand he really does care about us 24-7. And mm -hmm. even though Satan pulls us away, he's there when we want to come back, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I was <clears throat> raised in the church and baptized in front of all that, and in my teens, we stopped going to church, and I wandered away. Um, it was very selfish. In 20 years, I wandered, you know, drink, uh, drinking drugs, all that stuff. And, just threw my life away and even in there was times I mean I know my grandmother was praying for me I knew other people were praying for me and stuff so I know you know he was there I just I turned away and um you know I had a moment I went in in, in my program at the lodge and I, I wasn't getting it I just wasn't getting it. I wasn't seeing it I was still angry and selfish and I I, I, I cried out I wanted to ask God love me I mean I was in tears I mean it was at work and God, just just love me. You know what I mean? I'm I'm not getting this. And if I don't, if you don't do something, I, I'm I'm not gonna make it. And it, it it was it was a feeling inside of me. He he answered me. You know, it was he, I do love you. I mean, why stop trying so hard? You know what I mean? And I was like, oh my gosh. And from that moment on, I was like, wow. Okay, God does love me. You know what I mean? I'm not unloved. I'm not forgotten forsaken or whatever, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. Um, and, you know, you're right, getting into the Word. I mean, recently, since, you know, last, probably this last year, being in the Word every day, getting to know Him, um, it's almost as if you can't get enough, you know what I mean? So it's been, a, it's been an interesting, really cool progression for me. Um, I can relate to Him in this story you know what I mean, as far as having that moment where you got to, you know, feel it, I guess. But, you know, I'm excited. That moment when you stop resisting and you say, okay, God. Yeah, because I was doing everything under my own power. Mm -hmm. Trying to make it my own way and stuff. Mm -hmm. Control mm -hmm. all the pieces. So, yeah. And you finally say, oh, there really is something to this faith stuff. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, just my personal way of looking at things sometimes, is, most of the time, is this, a, is this giving or taking what I'm doing? Am I giving something in the final result, or am I taking something or receiving something? I say taking men because that means I'm doing this for the wrong reason, probably. Uh, maybe not totally wrong, but definitely not the right reason. Totally. So, I, when you relate to my own times, when I stop taking, that is when I stop taking the time on Sunday to go to church, and I you know, took that time, did something else with it. For a long, a lot of years, I played golf on that day. And even after a lot, a lot of years later, back to it, my pastor lived in the same neighborhood I did. And uh, actually, I introduced him to the neighborhood when he took the call. He, uh, I lived on the golf course, belonging to the club and. But I stopped doing that. If I was going to play golf on Sunday, I made it later in the day. But that didn't. As kids got older, that drifted away for a while. So I was finally giving my, I was giving that time. Ha ha, I gave it. That he already gave me. But I was back in church. I was back into the Word. I was leading Bible studies. I was doing a lot of things. And uh, one Sunday, there was a, a big tournament. 
And my partner and I were in the lead after the first day. So Sunday was, you know, a big day. It's a club championship type thing. A lot of betting on it, a lot of money floating around. And I didn't realize it, but it was like, you had to drive by the golf course to get to the church. Sunday morning, I drove to the golf club. <laughs> I was skipping church to play golf. My pastor knew my passion for golf, so he, but he, uh, uh, the rest of the family was at church. And he announced <laughs> during, at some point in time off the altar, that uh, Leo won't be with us today. He went to uh, St. Mary of the Lynx this morning. <laughs> 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 to the whole congregation. Now, I was known, I may have even been congregational president at that time, but it was just hilarious. And, but then he went on to say, and that's okay. You know? That's okay because you know, yeah, he, he, he will feel bad about missing it. He probably will play great golf. It won't get to him that bad. Um, so it's God's forgiving. You know, your pastor's forgiving. The congregation is forgiving. Um, they're saying, okay, that happened. I want to play around at golf isn't all that bad compared to some things you get done, but it, you know, things like that. And that's why I use my taking and giving. If I'm not giving, um, I shouldn't be taking. Or if I am taking, I'm not taking and acting in the way that the Lord wants me to be. Yeah. I believe the Lord wants me to be, wants all of us to be ourselves, but to keep our focus on Him versus all those other things that distract us. A golf game, a beach, uh, a concert, a play, something that you want to go to. And you have to make a choice. Do I go to this church service? Do I go to the play, let's say? And I don't know how you can say which is the one God wants you to do. You could go to that play, witness to one or two people, just incidentally, bring it up in natural conversation, and that could develop into something much bigger than you attending that worship service. So you, it's difficult to know that, and I guess you have to, let's see how you have to do it as we go through here. Because, uh, and Daniel, will you read the... Up beforehand, how did you do? How did I do what? In the tournament. You won. Okay. Oh, my playing partner is the district president slash bishop of uh, the Eastern District, New York City, Long Island, Central New York, and all of Eastern New York State. He was my playing partner. Um, I did have so. He was a, he was a good playing partner. He was a card carrying ten handicap golfer, except if we were playing for real money, then he was a scratch golfer. So the Lord's way of <laughs> he, he was a legit ten, but you got into something for some you know, not huge money, but more than a five ten dollar bet. Uh, he was a scratch golfer. He did not like to lose. Hmm. So, uh, you know, this, uh, this reminds me of the, the story about the Good Shepherd. A uh, shepherd, you know, with 100 sheep, and there was one lost. He go out and seek the one that was lost. And he found him. It's like he finds us. And the interesting part that I noticed was the little sheep didn't walk back, Jesus carried him. Carried him back. So he's out there looking for him, and he's willing to carry us. <clears throat> and sometimes to strengthen us, Jesus uses us as a tool to carry people back. Mm -hmm. Jesus finds them, and somehow arranges for us to meet them. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. Give us the burden to carry them back. Yeah. Well, as I said, you know, some people, some people plant the seed, other people, you know, nurture it, and other people harvest it. So like you know, harvest it. Mm -hmm. And some people then eat it. Yeah. Yeah. Danny, can you read the 
Next little section there. Sure. Jesus, the rock of truth. Knowing the mantra of the rock and roll industry is sex, drugs, and rock and roll, people often ask me how I've managed to keep my faith strong in today's entertainment, entertainment world. How have I avoided immorality and the self-worship of the modern celebrity influencer? How have I raised kids who know where to find truth in a society that is opposed to God? The answer to these questions and every other question of human existence are found in a simple question. Uh, in fact, it began with the question I first explored as a child. What does it mean to say that God is the boss? When I called God my boss, <clears throat> it was my five-year-old way of calling him Lord. It was the way of saying I would trust and obey whatever he says, even when I don't understand. Even when I don't want to, I will try to obey because he is the boss. He is in control. He is Lord. And I still take the, that approach today. The psalmist wrote, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Psalms 11, or excuse me, 115, uh, verse 3. That sums it up. He is the Lord and does whatever he pleases. Whatever he does is right. As a result, I have to live by his word and do what he says. When I don't, I have to change my ways. As I grew older, my understanding of the Cretans deepened. <clears throat> Even as a five-year-old, I understood that I had disobeyed the boss many times. Like when I had fist fights with my older brother, or when I and my friend next door broke all the seats in his swing set and then lied about it to our parents. I understood that I needed to ask forgiveness for these wrongs and that I needed to do what the boss commanded going forward. Still, it wasn't always easy. I, I haven't always loved it and I can't, and I can be on, excuse me, and can I be honest? There were many times I chose my own path instead of God's because of the moment I thought that I would prefer it. In those moments, sin seemed fun until I realized I had hurt both myself and the people I love. Every time I didn't, I don't follow the boss, I find myself a slave to the very things that cause me pain and suffering. But there is good news. There is a way to end the cycle of pain and self-destruction. Mm. Brief thought for the, the, the um, How many of us have not, have not felt this way more than once in our life? Mm -hmm. Okay, twice. All right, a hundred times. <coughs> Thinking back, we can't even count them, can we? Mm -hmm. It's just, <clears throat> we've all, all of us sitting here have gone through this. A 70 times 7. Mm -hmm. Liar, it was more than that. <laughs> now, this reminds me of Paul saying, you know, I, I do the things I don't want to do, and I don't do the things I should do. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, to paraphrase. And part of what I hope we are doing and hope we will see the results of it on the should do side is what Bill's been preaching at us for, I'm sorry, not just Bill, but that has been preached at us <laughs> um, in our whole the neighborhood study and the like that um, these empty chairs represent our failures. Those are the people we didn't bring in here. That are, that, are, that are on their road, you know, that are, have gotten back to the church, but that, they're out there on Sunday, person. They're back for Sundays. Well, this is part of Sundays. Why don't we get more? Why don't we invite, grab by the hand, drag them in here for one day just to see? And they'll be right there the next week to hold their hand. This time, hopefully, they'll walk with you in here. Maybe the third or fourth or fifth time, they'll be dragging somebody in here. And I think that would, I mean, this type of discussion would benefit so many people mm -hmm. who are in in this cycle that we go through, and on the bad end of the cycle right now. <clears throat> and you can't keep going up again by yourself. You need somebody to drag you up, push you up, get you started, 
And it surprises me how many, <clears throat> how many people will get in a, after church, they'll get in the car and just drive away. Instead of, and I've said, why don't you come on back? Mm -hmm. Anyway. And think. some of them will say, well, I have to go to work. If you, have to go, if you legitimately have to go to work, that's, well, some people do have to work. But some of them, I, I think they're just afraid to. I've given my time, like two hours or whatever. Hour and a half. And uh, there we go. Yeah, it does seem like some people are just checking the box, but in reality, we should all be hungry for the word. This place should be packed. Yeah, we don't, yeah, this we don't should... know what they do out there. You say yes, but I mean, up until the start of COVID, I was part of a men's, not a men's, I was part of a Bible study that met at 8.30 every Friday morning over at the Hope Center, which is a community support agency that has low-cost foods and free foods and thrift store type of stuff for anybody in need. It's not hard to get in, show an ID card, and claim on some sort of government assistance. Social Security counts, so that's all the old people would I did that for five years, the time that I was here. Nobody from this congregation ever attended, that I know of, but I never invited anybody. I just, I'm realizing today that I invited a lot of people to come there, but I never invited anybody from here to go there. You get opportunities all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, on the flip side of that too, I know I've asked people a lot and it gets frustrating after a while from asking so many people and getting the polite, oh, we'll see, or just mm -hmm. flat out no. And so it gets frustrating. And, you know, I have to renew that strength by coming up here and getting the word because I, I get, it's, it's tiresome you know, seeing so many people not want to go. You know, right. but you got to remember, you know, whenever you speak like that, you're still planting a seed, and you know, you have to, you know, let, let, let the Lord take it from there. Yeah, it's it, you know? the Lord says, His word says, My word does not return to me empty, right? Keep that in mind, yeah. right? Yeah. You're not the one who's bringing them in, right? The God Lord's is gonna bring them in, the Lord's gonna bring them in, not us. We're gonna plant the seed, maybe we can help sow it, but that's about it. And don't worry about the rest of it. The Lord will take care of it. You know? And even Paul recalled, you know, he says, you know, everybody, he's going to get the word out, but he realizes not everybody's going to take the calling. That's up to the Lord. Let the Lord worry about it. But it's our job to go out and speak, let, let, let Christ shine in us. You know? Mm -hmm. you know? And, not, and not, not get discouraged. Because it's the devil, like, you know, the devil's working 24-7. You know? Mm -hmm. So we got. Ah! Sure. Yeah, not quite. But the devil is making making a real effort to take and destroy us if he can. Oh, he's got to. Mm -hmm. That's his mission, you know. He, you know, when sin came into the world, he became, you know, he, he's the king of the world. He's going to be zealous to keep it. That's it. This, this leads right into this next, yeah. next section. Will you continue reading, please? Sure. Are you ready? Or are you ready? Oh, we're going to cut you off or something. Okay, you cut me off. All right, the prophet... Right where it says chapter 2. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> good. good stopping place. The prophet of following the truth. In high school athlete, uh, in high school athletics, a <laughs> prayer led us in um, stretches prior to working out. I hated the stretches and didn't believe they helped. I was uncomfortable, boring, excuse me, it was uncomfortable, boring, and seemed unnecessary. But the older I get, the more I realize the stretching is for my benefit. <laughs> it protects me from injury, enhances my workout, helps my recovery, and it keeps me limber. And what's true of stretching 
is true of obeying God's word. If you do it, even when it seems boring or uncomfortable, you'll be stronger, happier, and more fulfilled. I wish that I could convince everyone of the possibility of obeying God's word. In this book, that's what I'll be, that's what I'll attempt to do. Here I'll write in depth about how to find and apply truth. But before we do, we'll start with the foundation, with the understanding that God calls us to obey him and the truth he's given us through Jesus. Whatever Jesus says is unquestionably right. And if it were not, then following him is a waste of time. Jesus did not come preaching an easy message, but it was a message that contained a great promise. He said, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but they did not fall. Uh, because it had been found in the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And then the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Uh, Jesus knew the truth. Life is hard. Storms will come. <clears throat> do you want to be somebody whose life stands in the midst of those storms? Would you like to be someone who has a foundation so strong that you can weather whatever life throws at you, no matter how hard the trial or how hurtful the pain? When others wallow in misery and <coughs> want joy, then pay attention to Jesus and build your life on the rock of his truth. If you do, you will have hope where others have fear. You can rest assured that you are destined for glory when others suffer from the dissatisfaction of a destiny unfulfilled. <clears throat> but before we get ahead of ourselves, know this, we must prepare to obey him when it's difficult, uncomfortable, and when we do not understand. And this leads me to something often overlooked in this passage of scriptures. Hearing and believing the truth is not enough. Look at the verses directly before it. <clears throat> not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, uh, Lord, Lord, did, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do <coughs> many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. The one who hears claims belief, yet does not act according to his word, is precisely the kind of person Jesus never knew. These are the people who have built their houses on the sand, and when the storms come, they will not stand strong. Uh, Matthew Henry, the 17th century English minister and author, wrote concerning this passage. All the sayings of Christ, not only the laws he has enacted, but the truths he has revealed, must be done by us. They are light, not only to your eyes, but to our feet, and are designed not only to inform our judgment, but to reform our hearts and, and lives. Nor do we indeed believe them, if we do not live up to them. Observe, <clears throat> observe it is not enough to hear Christ's sayings and understand them, Hear them and remember them, hear them and talk of them, repeat them, dispute for them, but we must hear and all we must hear and do them. Uh, let's see. As Henry well knew, building upon the rock of God's word is not just about hearing or believing the right things. Rather, building a life on Christ means acting on the word of God. Should we stop at that point and discuss? This area, um, just thought that ran through my head is it progressed. Was uh, is this saying that works are necessary for salvation? 
don't come out doing things. They are necessary. For, for salvation? For salvation. After, after, after you believe. You believe. Oh, so not, not before, that, not in not, their own. They're not, not necessary for self. salvation. No, but because you, you're saved, you want to do those works, which is a different thing altogether. You want to do those things, and Christ expects you to do those things. But don't non, many non-believers want to do the same things and are doing them? But they don't believe in Christ. They don't That's believe right. in Christ and their Savior. So what, so, different, what different, okay, differentiates? Because they're a good person doesn't mean they're going to go. Save my faith alone, the works follow. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe, but I don't do any works. Hmm? What? I said I believe. But I don't do any of the works. I don't do. Faith without works is. It's, it's not like James. <laughs> Why wouldn't you show your gratitude? Because I don't think it's necessary. Well, well you, you may be surprised. <laughs> well, that gets back to what he said in Matthew seven twenty one through twenty three. Lord, Lord. <clears throat> On, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did, I, did we not prophesy in your name? I mean, that's exactly what you're doing. It's prophesying in his name, but the faith is not there. And I think that's what that whole scripture well, I, there I, is all about. I've got the faith. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the works. I'm doing... So I'm, I'm, find me. Hmm? I have the faith, but I don't do any of the works of do prophesying. I don't do any of that stuff. So I can, how can I be false? Well, when you, when you, if you have the faith, you're going to want to do the works. And the works will show your faith. Mm -hmm. But do I need to do the works? That's it. After, after you've had the faith, you, you do them as a result of having the faith. But do you, I think what you're trying to say is you do the works because of your faith. Because of the faith. Yeah. Yes. Not because there's any need to. No, because of your because faith. Because you're because of your faith, right. mm -hmm. you will be driven to do these works. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it, it watch a lot of people. Start slow, start slow, head over their head. Somebody gives them a hand. A little while later, both those people are in over their head. Somebody else comes along and they grab his hand or her hand, pull him up. Pull. That's what happens in a congregation. Only five people were doing stuff before, and they were way over their head. So they pulled some people to drown with them, and then they had ten people doing stuff, and they were still drowning. And they had fifteen or twenty, and they were still getting close to drowning. And how did that happen? Two people or five people were holding together, but were drowning. And you added five more. They still got drowning. They had ten more. You still had people drowning over their head. How could that happen? Do you ever notice how many people are in church when, it's, when there is communion, as opposed to when there isn't? That's something I was noticing today. It's a simple reason. Church wasn't crowded like it normally is. The people. That group of five that held the congregation together were doing what it took to hold the congregation of their size together. Got more people involved. They only got 10 people over their heads again. But what caused that is the activities of the congregation expanded. You got more people to do it. And as a result, more people are drawn in. So the reason those People who've taken on that burden, been dragged into it, roped into it, however we all get into it. <clears throat> um, we were brought in for a purpose and to grow the kingdom. And it works that way. You can see it. Sometimes it's a long point out of that. Why do you say that they're drowning? Because there are five people are trying to hold the whole congregation together. And the, the work it takes to do is more than five people can handle. Mm -hmm. 
when it's just what five people can handle and they can't do anything else. But they have a desire to do the Lord's work. That doesn't mean they're drowning. Well, drowning may not be the proper term. They're, in, they're overwhelmed in, it with, in the tasks before them. Um, and as they bring more people into help, that task before them keeps growing proportionally to the people here. So you're never really going to get out of that. You're never going to find enough people to do all that needs to be done. And you're continually pulling people in because you lose people, too. Well, that's a management problem. You may be doing too much. Or working out your own strength. The cause is the, the many causes that can get you this position. But if you're su successful in getting out of that position by getting more people actively doing things, more things will come to be done, come to, before you to be done. They may have been on the to-do list that if we ever have the money or the people, we'll get to it. Well, all of a sudden we have the money and the people, so those things get up on our A-list and we start doing that. You know? It'd be nice to clear out all the underbrush and stuff around the back corner of the property here for a lot of reasons. And uh, guess what? They're seriously considering that to go in and do everything from potentially harvesting the lumber that's in there is this one? And we're in the regulatory stage now. How much can we do? How much? There are rules in the city ties for what I hope. And how many you can take down and you have to replant and all this stuff. But that will happen. We've had more people. We've had newer people. Danny and Jennifer, we've had some other people. And that's where the city holds people back sometimes. Yeah, it was a good connection. Because Pastor wants this clear back here. Yes. So we can put that community garden. But it's, well, God's and, time, not our time. And my this theory, is not the end of theirs. They go on for another 10 minutes after they sing this song. <laughs> and my theory is nine and a half is picking stuff up. The city does not want this church to be a success. This property is worth more to the city tax-wise if, if there's a commercial building built on here. I sincerely believe the city works that way. Well, they must be really upset about the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially since those people don't vote. Yeah. Well, how do you know? <laughs> how do you know? Yeah. <laughs> Some do. Some dead people <laughs> vote. You ask Mark and George about that. No, it's a, uh, Another well, side effect I found with this medication, my, my mind just doesn't stick with where we're at exactly. What page are you looking <coughs> at here, Leo? 819. I was hoping to get to 21. Because that was happening. <laughs> We can read the rest. Yeah, Since the only children in that Sunday school room arrived with me this morning, they can wait. They can go out and play around and have a ball. They don't have to, we don't have, this group wants to stay, we'll stay. There's no reason we have to stay. Or I'm not, I'm not going to place to go. Well, we could always jump to the paragraph right before the next heading, which will sum it up. Unfortunately, I heard you, but I did not understand your word. Hearing problem. Oh, if you jump to 20, the paragraph right before the heading, it will sum up that section. <clears throat> well, since you have it, okay. you read it. If we actually believe God, then we will trust his word. If we believe he has the answers, that he is always right, that he is always loving, we'll do what he says. But is such a thing possible? Really? And then the heading, trusting the truth and life, death, and everything in between. Well, let's ask the question real quickly here. Do you believe that's really possible? We trust his word, we believe he has the answers, that he's always right, 
that he's always looking, that he's always loving. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 100% of the time. Yeah. 100%. 100% always all erections. And I can't all always endorsing. believe it. I'm a sinful human being, but it is true. I'm not arguing the truth. I'm arguing if we can do it. If yeah, sometimes it's always, true. always means never an exception. Well, we, we also have this little sinful nature that prevents us from, you know, uh, completely accepting his word without question and it's always about me, me, me. <clears throat> Once you confess Jesus is Lord, the devil is going to work on you. Oh, yeah. Oh, so it's like, and he's, he's going to throw, throw a stone in your way, and you may trip up, but you're still coming back to the Lord. Mm -hmm. He's going to bring you back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so basically, knows that. the always here really can't happen. Why? Because of Satan. Mm -hmm. Because he is... <clears throat> right below the strength level of the Lord. That right below could be huge, but it's still the number two God. Tied for second, probably. So he's got a lot working for him. He, he's the truth to life, you know. He's the truth yep. to way in life. We're the stumbling block. And he is, you know, Satan knows scriptures yeah. far better than any theologian that has ever existed. Oh, I'm sure he's examining it for loopholes. No, he doesn't want loopholes. He takes advantage of what's there, bends it just enough to steer us away from the truth. It's he it. just says, did God really say that? Yeah. Well, what did he mean? Not what does this mean. What did God mean? One of the last prayers that I do before I go to bed, I ask the Lord to protect me from Satan while I sleep. I said, I'm terrified of him. I do not want him to speak to me while I'm sleeping. Mm -hmm. I want to touch me. I ask him to have his angel encamp around me. It's not easy. Last night I got my feet where they weren't hurting. I got in a position in the bed where I could sleep. And I clearly got a good night's sleep last night. But today my mind is, I just, mm -hmm. my feet were hurting so bad there I could not stand up. I want to stand up to sing, but I couldn't do it. Let me read that last section. If you will. Okay. Trusting the truth of life, death, and everything in between. Death is a difficult thing to handle at any age. There are no easy answers and no quick fixes. Truth is, most people in my life have understood it if I became if I become angry or blame God after the death of my mother. It would be natural to ask how good God would allow my mother to die, especially at such a young age. And though I knew the Bible says that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. I recall asking myself, how is this possibly working for my good? Thankfully, my mother prepared me for the worst. She believed she would be healed, and she often said, if God doesn't heal me, you can't and must not be mad at God. He's always good, and he's always in control. And after her passing, though I didn't understand, I took her advice. I chose to believe in God's goodness rather than blame him. Still, I didn't hide from my emotions. I told God that I didn't understand why he allowed her death. I told him I was confused and brokenhearted. But even as I poured my heart out in prayer, I told him I'd still act upon his word and trust him. And as I did, God always showed up, big time, comforted me, he loved me, he led me. In the words of a killer band, if you can calm the raging seas, you can calm the storm in me. You're never too far away. You never show up too late. The psalmist said it much better. God is our refuge and strength, a very presence, help in trouble. 
Psalm 46, 1. I learned this from the young, youngest age. Even though I wish my mom hadn't died, I come to learn that this life is not about my wishes and my desires, but rather is about God's will and his ultimate glory. Spending a life surrendered to the glory of God brings salvation, peace, meaning, and soul satisfaction. <coughs> Through this book, I'm inviting you on a journey. I'm inviting you to know and understand a God who loves you. In fact, he loves you so much that he won't allow you to have peace while you continue chasing your own pleasures, your own desires, or your own ego, because those paths lead to death. I'm inviting you to explore a truth that answers the hardest human questions, including the questions of life and death. I'm inviting you a, a truth that's eternal and unchanging, one that will bring you unimaginable fulfillment. Follow me in this journey. Come and see the marks of a life built on truth. Then turn and build your life on the rock. That's a good answer. Mm -hmm. That is a good answer. And they, uh... Just thinking <clears throat> back to the words that the, of the rock band. If you can keep, if you can calm the raging seas, you can calm the storm in me. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, Pete. We can think of that when we're building up a rage of some sort, for whatever reason, against our neighbor, against God, against ourselves, against the police against the pastor. I didn't like his sermon, so I'll never come back in this church again. <laughs> Somebody, I don't know who it was, remember that weekend when pastor said that when he called the Pope the Antichrist, somebody handed him a note that said they were never coming back. I'm um, curious to... That wasn't that long ago. I, I keep... I remember it. But oh yeah, a couple of weeks. It had been two or three weeks. Wasn't that, but... It yeah. stuck in my mind. But... Uh, it, he doesn't preach off the cuff. What he preaches about is what God tells him to preach about. And he's not afraid to say it. And I give him a lot of credit for that. I told him both him and I don't get the love in this church that people should get us. That's why I told him I got you. And why it just actually hit very close to home. But this, I, my father passed away very young. <coughs> Excuse my voice. <coughs> my father passed away very unexpectedly. Um, I we just had a fourth child, young, younger, in my late 30s, early 40s, maybe I was 40. And uh, it just, Totally unexpected. My mother was in shock. My mother and father always planned. Their plan was, you know, <coughs> that they would have more time. They, had, well, they didn't. My mother proceeded to live for another 23 years. But uh, she had, but at the time, I was the oldest. I was the oldest. And that, uh, everything was kind of falling on me but it was still three and a half hours away and dealing with no cell phones or anything back then. <coughs> I remember <coughs> at the house after the funeral, the internment, uh, family, close family and friends were there. All who well, I knew. I was just overwhelmed how could, it was one of those, how could God do this to this group of people, to this family, to me. How am I going to deal with this? Well, at the time I was still running for exercise. My parents lived in a very hilly area, and I asked my godfather, I said, Tom, what's the highest point of you get to on a road? He told me the roads. I grew up in that area. So I left the party, put on some shorts and t shirts, running shoes, and my intention was to run to the highest point. 
never gave a thought of running back or walking back, rolling down the hill, just I was gonna get there. And by the time I reached the top of that hill, <clears throat> all my rage was gone. All my sweat was gone, all my energy was gone. <laughs> my new blisters, they were there. And as I looked down over the town, over the valley that it sat in, for whatever reason, all I could see were church steeples. That's all I could focus on. <clears throat> and then I wasn't raging anymore. I was saying, okay, I gotta prioritize how to do this. And I started running back down. Well, instead of turning in where we turned into my parents' house, I, my mind wasn't on it. I went all the way down to the river. So, so I got to turn around about two miles back uphill. But I did it, and I never felt it. I got back. <coughs> um, I got out of there. Donna said, what happened to you? I said, what? I exhausted. I got a quick shower. and I said, no, you look great. You know, your eyes are bright. Your energy is back. What happened? You got superhuman. I ran up, ran up to them. I ran them out. That was all I told them, and that was just a personal time in my life where the Lord exhausted me and then gave me more strength than I had by far because He worked all the bad stuff out of me. So, a very personal side of that, and it, and I did. I dealt with everything. My mom dealt with everything. We got everything under control. Yeah. And I can't remember if it was hard or not. It got done. And everything worked out fine. He even my father even got gravesite on they didn't have gravesite, so they, this was gravesite on the hill that if you look to the right, oops, I don't know angle like to the southwest. It overlooked uh, his golf course. His golf course he belonged. Just when my mother picked out the gravesite, I was with her. I never saw that. I mean it never hit me that it was. But my mom knew. She wanted it up on she knew right the area she wanted it in so he could over be looking his golf course. Never said that to anybody. A few years later, I was at the grave and I realized it. I looked at my mother and she just smiled. Before, before we finish up, and I'm not pushing a thing, I just sit here all afternoon, I'm enjoying this. I give me a chance to be out of the house. And he was like minded boosters. I'm going to read a little prayer in it. But the thing is, I'm not going to say when it happened. But I saw my own two eyes, and you, you can ask Ricky, he'll corroborate this. We both saw Pastor Bruce get disrespected in a way that made me physically ill, and I could not get out of the chair. Did the Lord want me to stay in that chair in here? I disrespected him to the point that it made me sick. That's all I'm going to say on it. I'm going to, now I'm going to read the prayer that I wrote. Dear Lord, there is too much meanness in our country and the world. Help us all to have compassion for our fellow man. Please help us to be more respectful. In your holy name, Jesus our Savior. Amen. Amen.